Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 65, June 13th to June 19th, 1862. Last week, we fought the battles of Cross Keys and Port Republic. We fought over Memphis, as well as had Jeb Stewart's first famous ride around the Union Army, and there will be more to come. This week we have a couple of scattered events, and if I may, I would like to add in some detail that will be helpful as we jump into the Seven Days Battles that will start next week. Before we do that, just as a quick announcement, speaking of the Seven Days Battles, we are going to have Patreon content. It's going to be another picture slideshow. We did one for P. Ridge a while back, and now we're going to do another one for Gaines's Mill, which is here in the Richmond area. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, seeing the battlefield in its current state, by all means, please check out the Patreon where that will be posted. Although it is a little out of order, let's start off with some legislation. June 19, 1862 would see the banning of slavery in the federal territories. We have the verbiage here. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that from and after the passage of this act, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any of the territories of the United States now existing, or which may at any time hereafter be formed or acquired by the United States, otherwise than in punishment of crimes whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. Now, remember when we were talking about the Homestead Act, the federal territories were certainly a point of contention. Obviously, in this point of the war, getting rid of slavery is not quite a goal, but it is on the table. Stopping the continual spread of slavery is on the to-do list, though, and taking advantage of a legislative branch without sovereign advocates for the institution would seem like a good idea. You may even remember that back in our Setting the Table episodes, we had filibusters like William Walker who were going out to potential new territories that could be claimed as potential slave states, future slave states. There's talk about annexing part of Mexico, Cuba is on the table, Central America. All these are options potentially for continued expansion of slavery. So this is putting a stop to that. It should be noted that with the passing of this particular act, the Dred Scott case ruling was nullified. So we have come full circle there as well. Perhaps I've mentioned this before, but a lot of troops in the North blamed South Carolina for the war in general, seeing as they were the first to leave the Union. The dislike of the Palmetto State would boil over when Sherman shows up in the latter stages of the war. But in 1862, remember the Union had a foothold with the capture of Port Royal, having fallen the previous year. David Hunter had been responsible for this area. Remember, he replaced Thomas Sherman. He would have two divisions of infantry under Horatio Wright and Isaac Stevens. Horatio Wright was a Connecticut native and engineer. He had previously appeared in our story being in charge of an attempt to destroy the Navy Yard at Norfolk before being captured by Virginia State troops. Wright will be sent to command the Department of the Ohio before shifting to the Eastern Theater for the rest of the war. After his military service, Wright will go back to engineering and was in charge of the completion of the Washington Monument. Isaac Stevens was a Massachusetts native graduating from West Point in the same class as Henry Halleck. Stevens had served in Mexico before moving out west for a time. 
Interestingly, he assisted in John C. Breckinridge's campaign for presidency. The divisions would be under the control of General John Benham. Benham had already been serving in West Virginia, but had been arrested by Rosecrans due to his insubordinate behavior. After having graduated first in his class from West Point, Benham had seen action in the Mexican-American War. Despite his experience, he was not well liked. In fact, Stevens would be quoted as saying of Benham that he was a dreadful man of no earthly use. Try that for a Yelp review. In his force would be the 79th New York, mostly made of Scottish immigrants who mutinied, if you recall, back in 1861, and the 28th Massachusetts, mostly made up of Irish immigrants. In fact, the 28th would later join the Irish Brigade in 1863. This would be the first battle for the 100th Pennsylvania, who will see action all the way to Petersburg. These troops would land on various coastal islands before coming to James Island. James Island, you might recall, was the island that housed Fort Johnson, one of the positions that had bombarded Fort Sumter. June in South Carolina, though, is not exactly the most comfortable of weather, and the marching by these divisions was difficult. Hunter's plan was to move up the island from their landing point on the south and move on Charleston. Moving past the symbolic importance of the city, it would remain one of the open ports for the Confederacy, key to getting help from abroad. Hunter, though, would not be present on James Island. Instead, he would give orders not to take the Confederate works, despite there being skirmishing already. Benham would find a loophole and see part of the orders were he could secure his camp. After the coming battle, Hunter would reread his orders before placing Venom under arrest, the charges eventually being dropped. On the Confederate side, John C. Pemberton commanded the defense of Charleston. Pemberton was actually a northern-born rebel who had married Martha Thompson of Norfolk, Virginia. Sometimes he is referred to as the worst commanding general of the war. And while it might not necessarily be fair to bring his loyalty to the Southern cause into question, what we can say is, yeah, he was pretty bad. Pemberton is one of these guys that has a very larger-than-life reputation, shall we say. He doesn't have a whole lot of experience to back up the rewards that he gets in terms of command. So he was a captain and very quickly rises through the ranks to become a general and eventually a major general as well. So it's one of these guys that you see them sometimes during the war that have these rises with really no rhyme or reason why they are able to get to the point that they get to. We talked about Gustavus Smith. That's another one who doesn't have battlefield success or even the kind of experience necessarily that's going to be conducive to commanding larger armies. And yet, he gets to a point where if he was a better battlefield commander, it might be him instead of Robert E. Lee. Pemberton was hard to get along with, one commander, Ripley Ransom, having already requested a transfer due to complications with his superior. Earthworks had been dug on James Island at a place called Secessionville, and oddly enough, this place may have had a name change earlier than 1861. We are not quite sure, but the former town of Riversville may have been renamed from talk of succession in the 1850s. The battery, with an 8-inch columbiad and two 24-pounders, was also called Tower Battery due to an observation tower that had been erected there. It was also called the Lamar Battery for Colonel T.G. Lamar, who was the immediate officer in control. Overall command of the Confederate troops was given to our old friend from 1st Manassas and Ball's Bluff, 
Shanks Evans. Evans had approximately 750 men, with 2,000 additional reserves that could be called up. Benham had some 6,600 men geared up for an assault. Hunter had given an order on June 10th not to attack the enemy, as much like McCullen, he thought his forces outnumbered and in need of additional reinforcement. Benham decided that there would be a surprise attack on June 15th, with the 8th Michigan, 7th Connecticut, 28th Massachusetts, 46th New York, and 79th New York leading the way. The attack plan would include two waves, conducted by two different brigades. Overall, though, there seemed to be some sort of confusion about the plan. When asked what exactly that was, Stevens would bark back at an artillery officer, Damn it, sir, there is no plan. Despite overrunning the pickets, the terrain was swampy and difficult to maneuver. Lamar had time to alert Evans and begin bombarding the enemy. There was a decimating fire on the regiments as they moved forward, the 8-inch Columbiad loaded with grape shot and tearing a hole in the center of the 8th Michigan. Some of the assaulting party was able to gain a foothold on the parapet of the defenders, but they would be dislodged by reinforcements. The waves would collide with one another, adding to the confusion. The 3rd New Hampshire, along with the 3rd Rhode Island Heavy Artillery, attempted to flank Tower Battery, but were unable to move through a waterlogged terrain. A counterattack by the 4th Louisiana Battalion would inflict heavy casualties on the regiment. With losses high and the return fire from the Union guns ineffectual, Benham would order a retreat. 689 casualties were suffered by the attacking North and 207 for the South. This, remarkably, would be the only land attempt to take Charleston, if you do not count the assaults on Fort Wagner later in the war. Do not fear, we are not done with Charleston as the Navy is going to eventually take a crack at it. A fairly interesting antidote about the Battle of Secession Bill was that it pitted two brothers against one another, and they might have been at the same area during the fight. Alexander and James Campbell were two Scottish immigrants who had moved to America, Alexander settling in New York and James in South Carolina. Alexander was the color sergeant of the 79th and actually planted the U.S. flag on the earthworks at Secessionville. James was a lieutenant amongst the defending South Carolina troops facing the 79th. Incredibly, the two would find out that they had been on opposite sides during the conflict, although they were denied trying to find one another amongst the pickets following the conclusion. Alexander would serve at 2nd Manassas, being wounded there. James would actually be part of the defending body of Confederates at Fort Wagner against the 54th Massachusetts, and would be one of only four men captured during their famous attack on that position. Both would survive the war and remain close until their deaths in the early 1900s. On June 17, 1862, we have continued action from the Western Flotilla, this time at St. Charles, Arkansas. Last episode, as mentioned, Memphis had fallen, which pushed the defenses in the Western theater of the war back even farther. There were very few bastions left on the Mississippi, so the Confederates would have to look elsewhere. I mentioned last week that following the fall of Memphis, there were several Confederate ships that were still stationed on the White River. Following the Battle of Pea Ridge, Samuel Curtis had retreated into Missouri before setting out again for Little Rock. Curtis, though, did not quite get there before his supply lines were stretched, forcing him to withdraw. Perhaps the Navy could provide some assistance in the capture of this area of Arkansas. This would go a long way to the elimination of continued threats posed by the River Defense Fleet, or at least what was left of it. <laughs>
Standing in their way was Thomas Heinemann, who was tasked with the defense of this area. St. Charles was chosen as a location to place some earthworks and maybe make a stand against the Union Navy. Heinemann had declared martial law in the area and authorized guerrilla warfare, which would go a long way in hindering both the U.S. Army and U.S. Navy. Several guns were scraped together to arm the earthworks at St. Charles, but they were not going to be enough when faced with the Union forces stacked against them. Confederates under Joseph Fry only had a portion of the 29th Arkansas. Ships around the defenses would be sunk, including the CSS Murapas, to create a barrier for the enemy. Fry was actually the former commander of the Murapas. Barely over a hundred men and seven guns would be ready in mid-June. Robert Davis would send August Kilty with the USS Mound City and USS St. Louis to lead the operation to capture St. Charles. With him were two timberclads, the Lexington and Conestoga, as well as infantry support in the form of the 46th Indiana, commanded by Graham Finch. Both sides would start to trade fire in the morning while Fitch landed his Indiana troops. USS Mound City and USS St. Louis would do most of the work, with the timberclads holding in the rear. A shot would hit the Mound City and puncture part of the vessel containing pressurized steam. This steam would fill the ship and unfortunately kill most of the crew. Only some 25 out of 175 would escape what was dubbed the deadliest shot of the war. As the USS Mound City drifted away, Confederate sharpshooters would open fire on the wounded attempting to escape, who did not surrender. With the St. Louis providing cover fire, Fitch's men of the 46 would move into position to outflank the smaller garrison. Facing the possibility of being taken by storm, the Confederates would spike the guns and attempt to retreat. Fry and about 30 other men were captured, Fry being placed under arrest for the firing on the wounded of the Mound City. In the aftermath, St. Charles had been taken, and the expedition was allowed to continue their advance, but at the cost of some 140 casualties compared to the reported six of Heinemann. Kilty would lose an arm as a result of being burned, and the second-in-command of the Mound City would suffer a breakdown as a result of the incident and be replaced by another officer aboard the Conestoga. The 46 suffered no casualties, but would lose men soon thereafter skirmishing with enemy cavalry. There will be more action from this expedition, especially in support of the soon-to-come attempts on Vicksburg. In June of 1862, we have our first action at Vicksburg, speaking of that city. This was the next strong point, in fact at this time the only strong point, there being no earthworks at Port Hudson as of yet. Vicksburg was another Gibraltar, though probably more relevant to our story, we could also call it another Drury's Bluff. Much like the Richmond area fort, Vicksburg had high bluffs that would allow for plunging fire. Unlike Richmond and New Orleans, though, the city of Vicksburg was along the river. Troops were already stationed there under the command of Earl Van Dorn. Some 30 guns would be situated to give the Union ships a tough time. Farragut would move forward and use Porter's mortar vessels to begin a bombardment of the city. Eventually, he would decide on June 28th to push past Vicksburg so that he could be reunited with Robert Davis and his flotilla. All but three of Farragut's vessels were able to move past the town along the Mississippi under fire. He would run into the same problem that the expedition on the White River saw, though. Water levels were dropping for the summer, so the deeper draft vessels would not be able to operate on certain areas of the river. 
Farragut would only have some 3,000 men from Butler, so assaulting the city was also not an option. Instead, these men would try to construct a canal so as to bypass the river, but they would not be successful. Farragut would have to send word to Halleck that a ground assault would be necessary. So we will soon begin the first campaigns for this important rebel city. I want to take a little bit of time to talk about the ramp up leading to the Seven Days Battles. Next week, we start this string of combat that will ultimately see the dislodging of the Union forces from the peninsula. First, I do want to mention that Lee is trying his best to get his ducks in a row. He has sacked Gustavus Smith from Field Command, Smith having suffered a nervous breakdown following Seven Pines. A certain amount of reorganization would be conducted with A.P. Hill given a full division to command. Jackson, his work having concluded in the valley, would be recalled and brought to Richmond. This action, combined with all the borrowing of state troops, would give Lee the closest he will ever come to parity with the Union Army. That certainly is something that a lot of folks don't necessarily realize in that Robert E. Lee does not quite have 100,000, 120,000 men, but he gets fairly close to that number, so it is not a situation where the army is completely outnumbered. Now, as we're going to see, it could also play negatively into the Confederate hands because there's going to be all these troops that can be used to have more reckless assaults, but we're going to see that shortly. Having all these troops also doesn't necessarily mean that their performance is going to be that of maybe other battles. Case in point example is Jackson's performance, which in the seven days will be something that we can discuss at another time. Although, I haven't seen it argued that he was suffering from a kind of battle fatigue, which, when you think about it, makes sense with all the running and gunning he has been doing since Kernstown. Things would not be perfect for Lee, but they would do well enough. Unlike Johnson, he was not worried about taking the offensive. Lee understood that bolstering of the defenses came first, which, as an engineer, he made sure to accomplish. Stronger defenses would mean less of a garrison, which meant a larger army that he could bring to the field. Jackson actually suggested he receive the remainder of the troops guarding the eastern coastal states, which would give him some 40,000 men, and an invasion of the north could commence. This was intriguing, but Lee was dead set on keeping Little Mac exactly where he was. And why is that, would you ask? Because he was determined to rout him from the field. That is a good segue into our next topic because we need to talk about McClellan. We've said a couple times that McClellan is a controversial figure. McClellan is this and that and blah blah blah. Well, let's get into it at long last, the nitty gritty if you will, because what happens in the next couple of days really says a lot about the guy. First, I will say that I do not share the opinion of some that he is out and out the worst commander the Army of the Potomac ever saw. Certainly not the best, but I would not necessarily classify him as the worst. McClellan suffers from many things. He is not the best of health physically. He has a chronic decision problem, like don't ask the guy about where to go to eat kind of indecision. He also has a lot of pressure heaved on him. Think of the nickname, the Young Napoleon. Expectations are extremely high. Napoleon is like the figure for all of these folks who went to West Point. Everyone wants to emulate his battle plans. In fact, I've seen many times how they compare battle plans to equivalent of, say, a masterpiece like Austerlitz, for instance, where Napoleon does win a great victory. So... When you're being compared to someone like that, 
can't necessarily be easy. McCollin has some good ideas. It's around this time he wants to shift the base of operations to Petersburg, realizing that that city, south of Richmond, if it was to fall, would essentially doom the rebel capital. In addition, he wants to knock out the defense at Drury's Bluff. Grant would make Petersburg a priority in 1864. Benjamin Butler would also try to take Fort Darling that same year. These were not new ideas because Little Mac had already thought of them. The main problem with McClellan is that he is always asking for more troops because he always thinks the rebels are outnumbering him with troop amounts that they couldn't even dream of. It starts to get ridiculous. You remember how Henry Halleck has something like 120,000 men at Corinth. Well, McClellan wants some of those guys to make the trek all the way to the east. Why exactly? Because, and it should be said, he has no basis for this idea, but he thinks that Beauregard is on the way with his army. Theory being that the Confederates would go all out to defend their capital, and in some ways he is correct. He is correct that Jackson is sort of insignificant in the valley. But Beauregard showing up to turn the tide, like some kind of Cajun boogeyman, is in fact ridiculous. It should be pointed out that intelligence is an issue with McClellan. Intelligence in terms of military intelligence, I should say. I'm sure Little Mac was a smart guy. Pinkerton has most of his spies captured, one being executed, so yes, that would be a problem. But McClellan frames Hanover Courthouse as a glorious victory, where Porter fights off the Confederate host, not a victory where he is facing a brigade of untested North Carolinians. If I'm Lincoln, I have a right to be angry. The famous correspondence contains the line, you must act. Lincoln, during this period, had come down to inspect the army. It's worth saying that the commander-in-chief is giving McClellan support. He sent Franklin with his division. George McCall and his Pennsylvania Reserve show up, which makes his reinforcements almost the same as what Lee is getting. One gets the idea that there is no alternative way that Lincoln could have managed George B., he is simply not the right guy for the job. He also has an impact on the public opinion of the war. Correspondence is censored, reflecting what McClellan thought they were facing in terms of the enemy numbers. This makes it look like the administration is not giving the proper support to the Army of the Potomac, which angers citizen and soldier alike. I think the biggest mark against McClellan, in my opinion, is what we will see in the Seven Days. He will not take command of his troops, instead leaving the decision-making to his subordinates. Why? Because he is worried about evacuating his force to save them. And yeah, I did do some air quotes there for save. I know you couldn't see it. This is sort of inexcusable in my opinion. But we will see over the next two episodes, and you can decide for yourself at the conclusion. Enough ranting about George B. McClellan, though. We had a fairly jam-packed episode. There were two naval affairs in the Battle for St. Charles and Farragut passing the batteries at Vicksburg. We also fought the Battle of Secessionville, which is one of those forgotten battles of the war. You can actually pair that one kind of nicely with Williamsburg, also considered one of the forgotten battles of the war. Now we have also set up very nicely for the Seven Days Battles, which I will finally begin next episode. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated.
Once again, feedback is welcome. Any kind of questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week.